So now that we've understood what the different kinds of business structures one can have, starting from a sole proprietorship all the way to a public company, it is now time to take a look at some key principles of corporate law. There are five basic principles of corporate law. And if you can understand these five, you should be able to derive or work out all the other underlying principles or logic or philosophy behind company law. These five principles can be divided into four, can be, can be divided into three categories, right? Allow me to explain. Out of these five, there are two sets of two principles that must go hand in hand. And there is a fifth one that is pretty much standalone. What are these two pairs of principles? The first pair is a legal personality or separate legal entity and limited liability. The other pair is shared ownership and transferable shares. And of course, the odd one out is the separation of ownership and management. Let's go over each of these principles one by one. Let's consider, let's go back in time and consider um, a company that has just started. We'll call it the East India Company, the British East India Company. And we realize that this is a company that is going to engage in fairly risky ventures. Now, mind you, when the British East India Company was formed, you did not have the Suez Canal. What this meant was that ships coming in from the United Kingdom all the way to India would have to go all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, which at the time was notorious for bad storms and for ships that never returned. As a result, this is a fairly risky business. And in order to allay the risks of this business, what many people did was that they came together to pool their resources into one fund. They used this fund to buy ships and man them, crew them, and to send them off in search of the East Indies, uh, where they would trade perhaps um, uh, tobacco for opium, for cotton and spices, so on and so forth. But the idea that if this business venture failed, that we would not be liable as shareholders, we would not be liable for any further damage or liability. This is an idea that came up in the 17th century when we were thinking about the modern joint stock corporation. So one of the, one of the underlying principles of company law is that of limited liability. Now, limited liability works for both the company as well as the shareholders. Now, when you put in money into a company, let's say you've, you've pulled together resources from a few shareholders and we now have the company uh, with, let's say, a pool of resources of, let's say, a thousand rupees. Now, it uses these thousand rupees to work um, to, and, and puts that to good use and to gen start generating income. Now, over time, let's say from that income, the company's value grows from a thousand rupees to 1,200 rupees. And then some kind of an accident takes place. If the accident was caused by the company, then the company would be liable to pay whatever compensation or damages. However, if the, if the amount of damages or the amount of compensation exceeds 1,200 rupees, the idea of limited liability protects the company saying that you would not have to pay more than what is your worth, more than your liability. In other words, the company can restrict or limit how much compensation it has to pay out in case there is a mishap. Now, how does this work for shareholders? Let's say as a shareholder out of that original 1000 rupees, I have committed to paying the company or contributing 200 rupees to the company, which means that if there is a liability against the company and the company cannot pay on its own, I have not paid my 200 rupees yet. I would now have to pay that 200 rupees, but only that 200 rupees. The, the people who are, who have instituted legal proceedings against the company, the judgment holders against the company to whom the company must pay compensation they cannot 
touch me or they cannot reach into my personal finances in order to cover their damage. Consider this as a real life example. Kingfisher Airlines took up huge amounts of loans uh, many years back and over time they weren't able to do well and as a result they defaulted on their loans. Now, in normal circumstances, what the lenders to Kingfisher Airlines would have to do is to take possession of their goods, aircraft, which is hypothecated to them, take possession of the properties that were mortgaged to these lenders, such as Malia House and Kingfisher House in Mumbai. They would sell off these properties and use the sale proceeds to set off their debt. They would not be able to charge Dr. Vijay Malia under normal circumstances. And yet, Dr. Vijay Malia happens to be in the news every now and then because he is the subject of an extradition trial in the United Kingdom. Of course, the United Kingdom passed a judgment of, of, of about a week back saying that they will not be able to extradite Dr. Vijay Malia. Now, Dr. Vijay Malia, as the promoter and majority shareholder of Kingfisher Airlines, is liable to pay off the debt that is owed by Kingfisher Airlines to the extent of his shareholding, which he has already paid to Kingfisher Airlines. However, under normal circumstances, the lenders would not be able to reach out to Vijay Malia to say that now you must pay us from your personal finances under normal circumstances. But we know what's happened here. Dr. Vijay Malia had executed a personal guarantee in favor of Kingfisher Airlines saying that if Kingfisher Airlines is unable to repay um, this, this loan, then he would pay himself personally, which is why you have these lenders going after Dr. Vijay Malia. In other words, this idea of limited liability creates, as we've just seen, creates a barrier between the company and the shareholder. It creates a sort of a protection against any liability that the company may incur from a third party, that this third party will not be able to implicate the shareholders and will not be able to tell the shareholders that now your company is incapable of making good this loss, you must pay. There is a barrier in between. What do we call that barrier? You guessed it. We call it the corporate veil. So the corporate veil is nothing but a protective barrier between the company and the shareholder, which means now that the company is treated as a separate person, that the company ought to be able to sue and be sued in its own name, ought to be able to enter into contracts in its own name, ought to be able to own property in its own name. Thus, the idea of limited liability eventually evolved to ensure that companies are held to be separate legal entities with their own legal personality. So this is how the first pair came along. Now you might ask, why is it that we developed the abstract idea of limited liability? Why not have unlimited liability? Well, the reason being that in order to promote business, in order to promote um, industry, Courts and governments felt that some kind of protection must be accorded to businesses. Now, we know that most startups fail, about 9 out of 10 startups will fail. So in order to protect entrepreneurs and therefore to incentivize entrepreneurship, governments and courts um, passed or, or, or acknowledged this abstract notion of limited liability. And thus, from limited liability, we also get a separate legal entity. Now, we know what a separate legal entity means. It means that a company should be able to own property in its own name, should be able to enter into contracts in its own name, should be able to institute legal, legal proceedings in its own name, and can be sued in its own name as well. So this was the first pair of principles of company law, um, legal personality and limited liability. In the next segment, we'll see what is shared and transferable ownership.